Hello, um, happy Monday, and welcome to lecture 28. We're going to continue working on statistical thermodynamics. And we'll start with the Boltzmann hypothesis. All right, and, and what, what gives is to classical thermo, uh, Boltzmann is to statistical. And so these are really giants and that's the reason why their names are all over everything. My, my understanding is that Gibbs was a pretty straight shooter and, and his biography is a little bit on the boring side. <laughs> that's my very quick read of it. Boltzmann was a, was a much more turbulent individual. And so um, uh, it may not have been fun to be Boltzmann but his biography is a lot more interesting. So if, if you have a moment, you, know, you might read a little bit about his life. Anyway, but we're just gonna focus on the science. Um, so here's the preamble. We have this quantity, which we counted uh, microstates, right? Omega, it describes, it describes a stability. We haven't put it in these terms, but it follows from everything we've been doing. Omega describes the stability of a macrostate because the state with maximum number of microstates will appear All right so this is a this is an observation from what we've done so far and i and i hope this is this is sensible to you that the state with the maximum number of microstates will appear the most stable it's the most likely and if you find yourself in that state, you're very unlikely to get out of that state. So it's gonna to appear to have this property of stability. And if you remember towards the beginning of this class, we defined equilibrium as having this property of stability. And so there's some connection there. And so uh, Bolson made that connection with his hypothesis. And his hypothesis is that the entropy is a function of the number of microstates. So the entropy of a macrostate is a function of the number of microstates corresponding to that macrostate. And more than that, he hypothesized that entropy is a monotonically increasing function of omega. Right, so this is a monotonically increasing function. So, you know, what that means is that max S means max omega, right? So we're gonna use that. Max entropy means max omega. So that's, that's a hypothesis. All right, so we're gonna consider the form of that function. This is pretty easily done. Consider two isolated systems. Right, we have system A and system B. System A is some stuff, don't know what it is, All right? And it has number of microstates omega sub a, and it has entropy extensive S sub a. And system B is some other stuff. It's isolated from system A. It's over on a different room on a different shelf, what have you. And it has microstates omega sub b and entropy S sub b. Right, okay. So first of all, entropy is extensive, which means that the total entropy in the system, 
like any other extensive quantity, what, what should the entropy of the, the whole be? Here, I'll label it total. Well, it would be the entropy of A plus the entropy of B. Yeah. Like any other extensive thing, like marbles in a jar or moles of moles of material, you just you just add them. Right. Okay. But um, the total number of microstates is I'll call it combinatoric. I don't know if that's a word. What I mean is the total number of microstates available if you consider both systems is what? You can have microstate one and all of these, and you can have microstate two and all of these, and microstate three and all of these, and so forth. So what's the expression for the total number of microstates considering both systems at the same time? Is it the product of A and B? It's the product, yeah. Right, so entropy is additive, but omega is uh, multiplicative. So that means F of omega total, which is F of omega A times omega B is F omega A plus F omega B, right? We're using both of these properties now. Okay, so um, who knows a function that has this property? That the function of the product is the sum of the functions. Log. Yeah, right. So we come up with this conclusion, which is that this function we're looking for, which is entropy, is proportional to log of omega. And we're gonna right now just have a you can have a prefactor out there, it doesn't change. And so we're gonna call that prefactor K and we'll put a B under it because it'll be Boltzmann's constant. We don't know what it is yet. Boltzmann's constant. And this is known as Boltzmann's entropy formula. So just like that, we have an equation, a pretty simple looking equation that gives us the entropy for a system as a function of the number of microstates. That's pretty cool. All right, so we still don't know what Boltzmann's constant is, but that's okay. So let's, let's see what some implications of that are. We'll start with this thing, configurational entropy, which we have talked about throughout the term. Configurational entropy. So what is it? It's a number of ways to configure a system in space. So I'm going to draw a a grid. This is going to be simply suggestive. We're not going to analyze my drawing because I'm just going to be rough about it. Let's just put a particle here and a particle here and a particle here and a particle here. What we're going to do is we're going to count the number of ways to distribute n molecules into R boxes. And we're gonna have those boxes sufficiently small such that no box has more than one molecule. So we're dividing space up into tiny, tiny, tiny little voxels. Well, we, we know how to do this already. We talked about this the other time. 
it's um, this is just r choose n, and that's um, r factorial. Uh, wait, sorry, over n factorial. There's an error in the notes there. Um, r minus n factorial, r choose n. Okay, good. So now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, let let the total number of boxes be the total volume divided by some little volume B. And so this is total volume and this is a little voxel and we can say corresponds to volume Right. We could say this corresponds to the volume of a molecule. molecule. It's a tiny, tiny little amount of space, but it enforces our, our condition here that the boxes cannot have more than one molecule. Okay, so now it can be shown, you will on the P set, can be shown that the log of R choose N all right, you're going to take the log of omega. That's the that's the Boltzmann hypothesis, Boltzmann entropy formula thing. So you're going to take the log of this binomial coefficient. The log of R choose n is approximately n log r for r very very much larger than n. So r very very much larger than n corresponds to um, let's say a gas. Most of space is empty. There's a large number, a much larger number of, of voxels of space than there are molecules to fill them. So that, that's like a gas. And uh, this is, um, right, that, that's a problem on the current P set. Okay, so far so good. Now what we're gonna do now let system expand. Expand from volume to to volume. So we're gonna we're gonna do an expansion of this gas, and we're going to calculate delta s. Well, we're gonna do this using statistical thermodynamics now. We're not gonna do it the way we did a month and a half ago. You have Boltzmann's constant times N. And let's see, log two volume over B minus log volume over B. And we can collect terms and simplify. This is KB N log two V over V equals k b n log two. Okay. So this here, k b n, this is r for n equals Avogadro's number. We recall this from the classical derivation, isothermal expansion of an ideal gas. This is the same result for isothermal expansion of ideal gas. All right, delta S equals R log V final over V initial. Okay, so this is one way to start identifying what that Boltzmann's constant is. Boltzmann's constant is R divided by Avogadro's number. Okay, that's cool. That's neat, right? We've done this weird statistical thing and 
you know, good old Ludwig came up with, with this. And we find that when we calculate um, a simple case, we get functionally the same thing as when we calculated this case when we didn't know anything about molecules, right? And <laughs> we were just dealing with classical thermodynamics. We can make the connection via the coefficients. That's cool. Okay, questions about this? Because I'm going to move on to the next thing that, that Boltzmann did. Okay, the next thing we're going to do, and what we're really building up to here, is the maximum entropy condition. Maximum entropy condition and the Boltzmann distribution. So we get Boltzmann hypothesis, Boltzmann entropy formula, and there's going to be Boltzmann distribution, there's Boltzmann constant, right? The person's name is everywhere. And, and this will, we're going to set this up and do. most of it, but this will carry over into lecture 29. It's that central that it's worth taking the time. All right, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna consider n total particles distributed over our states according to the occupation numbers we have these occupation numbers from last time All right that's a set of numbers n of one n of two and of all over all the way up to n of r so how many states are how many particles are in each state Right, okay. And we're going to calculate the entropy of this thing. So again, taking from last time, from last lecture, is gonna be KB times log N of total over product N of I, everything factorial. Now I'm going to use Sterling's approximation. Use Sterling's approximation to get to the next line, which is going to be KB, let's see, N total log N total minus N total minus sum n of i log n of i plus sum n of i. So that uses Sterling's approximation. And then I'm going to use the fact that the sum over i of n, n of n i equals n total. So the, the sum of where all the particles are equals all the particles. So I can simplify a little bit. This equals KB n total log n total minus sum over i n of i log n of i. And now I can condense this a little bit. I'm going to flip the numerator and denominator, figure the minus sign. And I get log n of i over n total. Okay, so so far I'm just playing with numbers. So right? I have the entropy is the sum for n of i log n of i over n total. By the way, this kind of looks like x log x, doesn't it? It kind of looks like our ideal entropy formula. Anyway, just a passing observation. Okay. 
All right, so that's fine. Here's the science insight. The distribution of occupation numbers The distribution of occupation numbers is an unconstrained internal variable. That means that those particles are going to fluctuate. They're going to fluctuate in and out of different states. And that's an unconstrained process. So in our previous example, you know, you had particles in a box, and I think you could imagine these particles in general move. So they could jump in between boxes. That's an example of jumping in between states. We're going to make this a little more general and and uh, and not limited to states being positions in space. We're going to have a more general expression. We're going to say, let's say, state right, i minus one. We have state i and state i plus one and so forth. And we're going to allow that, you know, let's say there's at any given moment, let's say there's four particles in this state, let's say there's two particles in this state, and there was a third, but that particle jumped, right? It fluctuated and went over here. This is simply visually acknowledging that these states are fluctuating, the particles are fluctuating between them. These fluctuations. can and will happen. Right, okay. So if that's happening, the maximum entropy condition S equals S max requires that S is what? stationary. As we have done now so many times in this class, it has to be stationary with respect to all unconstrained internal processes. So this conceptually where we're going is, is the following. We did something like this before. We've done it multiple times. When we had uh, two systems that could exchange volume, we required the entropy is stationary with respect to that. And we got the mechanical equilibrium condition, right? Pressures are equal. When we had two systems that can, can exchange energy, we wrote out the max entropy condition and we required that the entropy is stationary with respect to the energy exchange. And we got the thermal equilibrium condition. We got the temperatures are equal. And likewise with systems that could exchange particle number, we got chemical potential being equal. And add, adding that whole thing up, we called that thermodynamic equilibrium. All right, so now we're, we're doing something slightly different. We're requiring this entropy is stationary with respect to exchange between different states. And it's pretty general right now. So, you know, um, a little bit vague, but there are there are clear similarities to what we've done earlier in the class. At least they're, they're mathematical similarities. So ds prime, let's write that out, equals minus Boltzmann's constant. And what I'm doing is I'm just taking the total derivative. So L log n of i, d n of i, plus n of i over n of i d n of i minus log of n total d n of i minus n of i over n total d 
just taking the total derivative of the um, of the expression on the previous slide. And this, this simplifies pretty readily. And I get minus Boltzmann's constant and the sum over log n of i over n total d n of i. All right, just again, making this explicit. I just took the total derivative of this using the chain rule. All right, so that's the S. And I have all my little unconstrained internal processes here, little fluctuations between the occupation numbers. All right, now let's apply my constraints. That's what we did before, and that's what we'll do again. And in this case, I'm going to apply isolation constraints. Isolation constraints. So I want my system to be isolated. Max entropy is the equilibrium condition for an isolated system, right? We, we remember that. So there's my little fluffy, there's my, you know, the, the pink, ice, pink insulation here surrounding my system. And uh, I've got system surroundings. And what? Uh, the boundary is rigid. It is impermeable. And it is insulating. All right, now we're going to allow that the states might have different energies. Let e to the i be the energy per particle state i. And I don't want to just slip this in there. This is kind of new. This is kind of new for us because um, previously, like in the baby book, and even uh, just you know, 15 minutes ago, in this example of configurational entropy, we had this idea that space was somehow flat and uniform. And the energy of each particle would not be dependent on, on its position, right? So if the states are positions, maybe you have a gravitational potential, or maybe you have an electric field, right? Maybe this is a battery and there's an electric potential, and maybe the particles are charged, and then you can imagine energy and space becoming conflated. But more generally, there's no reason why these states have to be positions in space. They could be spin states or vibrational states. They could be rotational states. They can be anything that um, is, is distinct, right? Different states of a particle. In general, these different states can have different energies per particle. Okay, so E sub i equals the energy per particle in state i. And so we're going to then say the total internal energy uh, is pretty simple. It's just adding up all the energies. E sub i times N sub i. And that means that du equals E sub i dN of i conservation of energy. So you're going to study a system of elastic uh, collisions in, in the lab, right? And the individual particle energies are going to be changing, but I think you can trust that the total system energy for elastic collisions are rigid, you know, billiard balls, uh, that doesn't change. So what one gains, another loses, and so forth. And likewise, we have the total number of particles. And this is a pretty simple expression. This is the sum of n of i, right? And that means dn total equals the sum dn of i. I'm sorry, I forgot. And this is going to be 0, 
and this is going to be zero, right? Conservation of mass. Conservation of mass. So now I have some mathematical ways to apply these conditions. And I'll just make a note, a note in passing. This um, really is beyond the scope of this class, but those who are interested. Conservation of volume And you might say, what about volume? Before, two months ago, you were conserving volume, right? Energy particle number and volume. We're not touching conservation of volume right now, but it is, it's connected to the EIs being constant, right? When I took DU, I didn't apply the chain rule and allow the E of I's to change. I assumed they were constants. And that comes from the conservation of volume. So when you take quantum mechanics next semester, um, this, this, you know, this comes out right away. So, all right, but we're not gonna touch it here. Okay, so this is a case of constrained optimization. Constrained optimization, right? Constrained optimization is, is the most important application of calculus in engineering and business, right? It's in general what you do in Sloan and what you do in course 16 and course two, a little bit less in course three, but you, know, you should remember this from, from calculus. So we want to optimize that function subject to constraints that the energy and the total particle number are fixed. So we're going to use the method. Does anyone remember? What method are we gonna use? This is from Multi, French name. Lagrange multiplier. Yeah, thank you. We're going to use the mesh of Lagrange multipliers. So in your calculus textbook, you would have used the del operator. I'll just write that here just for sort of familiarity, but then we'll switch back to our operator. And so what do we have? Del, the thing we want to optimize, plus del, the things which are conserved. And we have Lagrange multipliers. So we have del and total and del u and this whole thing is going to be zero, right? This is written as in your calc textbook. Right, with the with the, uh, with the del operator. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna write it this way. Ds plus alpha d n total plus beta d u equals zero. And alpha and beta are the Grange multipliers. I was talking to my wife about this actually. She teaches college math. And um, it does seem this is the most important application of calculus uh, outside of uh, some specialty areas, you know. Um, the most, at least the most widespread. Anyway, um, so, so we're gonna substitute our expressions. We have expressions for ds and du and dn total and uh, and collect terms. That's what we're going to do. So we substitute our expressions and we collect terms and we get the following: sum over states. We're going to have minus k sub beta log n of i over n total plus alpha plus beta e of i 
d n of i equals zero. Okay, so um, right, what is this functional form? What is this form? This is just like we did two months ago, starting about two months ago for the case of unary systems. Right, we have here an unconstrained independent a set of unconstrained independent variables. And so we want this whole thing to be zero. How do we ensure that this whole thing is zero? Remember these differential forms? What did we call the prefactor in front of the differential of the independent variables? Well, you just set the coefficient to be equal to zero. Coefficient, right? Exactly. We're going to set each coefficient to zero. Right. Okay, so let's do that. Minus k b log n of i over n total plus alpha plus beta e of i equals zero. Or I'm going to rearrange n of i over n total equals e to alpha over k b e beta e of i over k b. And this is true for each state i equals one, two, through say r. So we're not there yet, but we just have something really important happen. We have, this is a distribution function, right? This is describing the occupancy of state i. And it's a fractional occupancy. It's n of i over n of total. So the fraction of particles that are in state i. And it's exponentially dependent on the energy of state i. All right. So I want you to notice two things here. I'll just repeat what I said, that this is a distribution function. All right. That's a very useful thing. That's a distribution function. And it's exponential in E of i. But we haven't finished yet because we have these Lagrange multipliers. So we don't know what those are yet. So we're gonna we're gonna determine one of them now, and we'll determine the other one on Wednesday. So okay, so we're going to we're going to determine alpha by normalization. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is uh, the sum over all of i, n of i over n total. What is the sum? Sum over all of i, n of i over n total. Is it just one? Yeah, it's one. It's one. So if we uh, set that equal to one, we get the following, e to the alpha over Boltzmann's constant equals one over sum over i e beta epsilon i over k p. And we're gonna give this thing a name. We're gonna call it the partition function. The partition function Q is the sum over all possible states, E beta E of I over K Boltzmann. So for now, it's just a name. Say, so what, what does that mean? It normalizes the distribution. Why is it called partition function? It describes all the different ways that the energy can be partitioned in the system. So it's sort of a sum over all the states. It's somehow characterizing 
the system and all the ways energy be, can be partitioned in there. Partition function. normalizes the distribution function. So this distribution function n of i over n total is equal e b beta epsilon i over k beta divided by q. Okay, so I'm ending, uh, it looks like I ended about five minutes early, but uh, better that than rush through the, uh, the derivation of, uh, or determination of beta. Of beta. So um, I'm gonna stop now and take questions. Could you explain the Lagrange multipliers a little bit? I yeah. can't find it. Yeah. Um, So you have um, how you want a subject, you want this to be zero, subject to the constraint that this is zero and also this is zero. And um, you know these are zero because you, you're applying those constraints. And so you can, you can add these to the equation of delta S equals zero without fundamentally changing the equation. And then alpha and beta are not necessary mathematically, but they generalize the situation. And so then you can effectively relax, you can relax your constraints here and the overall constraint is maintained by alpha and beta. So your method of Lagrange multipliers is only valid with the, the, the equations that result from this appear as if they might be valid even when the constraints on on total number of particles and energy relax but they're not you have to remember that so the equations that we get from this method are only apply are only applicable when u of t and n of t are fixed all right so um so that's 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 sort of the concept point here and so when we when we derive a distribution function um yeah, we're gonna, we, have, we have this distribution function or we have this form here. And this of course also relates to the Arrhenius rate law, if we're getting there. And, and people will um, see this distribution function um, so often in natural sciences um, that it's important to remember it's not always true, right? It, 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 is, it is very specifically true that it is the distribution function that maxima optimizes entropy under this condition. So I think that's that's the concept here. Um, so don't apply it willy nilly. Great, thank you. But you don't have to worry. This isn't a calculus class in the sense that I'm going to ask you to derive this or even repeat this derivation. But you know, I do want you to know where this comes from because this is going to start becoming second nature. Not necessarily in the next week and a half, but this distribution function is going to be so familiar to you by the time you're a fourth year student in material science, um, it's good to remember that it, it comes from somewhere and it's subject to um, assumptions. 